You guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. All right. Our first example is going to be Saul, the King Saul. You know, he was a, a really big strapping fella and very attractive guy. Uh, but he'd, he'd come from a difficult family. Uh, apparently, his, he was afraid of his father. So, I mean, his father must have been a strong disciplinarian, or maybe he disciplined with anger. Uh, but Samuel was the first king. You know, who was the first king of Israel? I mean, Saul. No, that's not right. No. Who was it? God. Right? God was the first. I just thought that was a little trivia there. No extra charge. So Samuel, I mean, Saul's going to get crowned today from the tribe of Benjamin. You know, tribe of Benjamin was a big deal. They, uh, they stuck with Judah, you know, uh, and now here he is. You know, it's his big day. The Bible says Samuel called all the tribes of Israel in, and the tribe of Benjamin was brought out front in honor, and they were getting ready, and they got the crown and everything, and they go, well, where's Saul? They couldn't find him. Listen, they had to pray. I told the kids they did 1-800-LORD or something and got Lord, the Lord on the phone and said, where is Saul? You know where he was? Hiding in the baggage. He was hiding. Later on, when Samuel's talking to him, he says, you were, you were small or little in your own eyes. That means his estimation of himself was not very much. You know, even though he was head and shoulders taller than anybody else, and he was a, a good-looking man and talented and powerful, but he didn't think much of himself. We see the same thing happen to Peter. You know, Peter's flying high. He's, he's going to be the one who carries the rock. Some think that passage where Jesus, you know, he tells, Jesus said, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you, you know, you're the son of God, you know. And he says, and you are, you know, you're the rock, Peter the rock. And his word, his name does mean that. But the, the implication there, Peter's not going to be the head of the church. The gospel's going to be the head of the church. But anyway, Peter gets credit and Peter feels great. And 30 minutes later, Jesus began to tell them, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I've got to be mistreated by the elders. I've got to go to the cross and then I'm going to be resurrected. Now, they believed that he had come to establish the kingdom. They thought he would, when they thought on this last, this third year of going to Jerusalem, that he was going to go in there with lightning bolts in his hand and, and dismiss the Sanhedrin and say, I'm now the king. But he said, that's not why I came. So when he began to explain his real mission, <laughs> Peter's like, was it Ethan said, what did he say about the vibe? You're killing the vibe, Lord. You know, you're such a downer, man. What's it? What? And, and the Lord, the Lord, he, this was his descent. He said, get behind me, Satan. You're focused on the things of man, not the things of God. So now, and now it's the night. They're in the upper room. And, and what, is, what is Jesus predicting that Peter's going to do? He's going to deny him three times. Now, Peter's not that kind of guy. Peter is really proud of the fact that he's loyal. He thinks of himself as brave. And he tells the Lord, listen, I will die with you before I betray you. But what happened? You know, he couldn't live up to that. You know, he, his mouth wrote checks that, uh, you know, the rest of him couldn't cash or something like that. And Peter's fear of death overwhelmed him. I love the way Luke describes it. Luke 22, 60 through 62. Uh, this is his third denial. He said, man, I don't know who this is or what you're talking about. And it says, even while he was speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Across the room, <laughs> here's his third denial. The Lord turns and looks at him in the eye. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Broken man. 
Well, look, he got so broken. This is, I'm reading in, I'm not, I don't have exact evidence, but you know, in John 20, not long after this, he said, I'm going to go fishing. You know, the Lord had already resurrected. He was back in the game. He gave the great, he gave the great, you know, the great sermon on Acts 2, right? But he's going fishing. He had become so discouraged with himself, so overwhelmed by his own failure, his own weakness. See, we don't think we're supposed to be weak. We think in our humanity, in our, in our self, that we're supposed to be strong enough to do the right thing and resist the temptations and never fail in a big way. This was Peter. So he got down. He got really down. And what, he, and what I think he did is he devalued himself. He declared himself a betrayer. See, here's the difference. He didn't betray the Lord. He was a betrayer. You know, you didn't, you didn't just sin and, and harm your marriage. You know, you're, you're, you're an adulterer. You didn't commit adultery, you're an adulterer. That, see, that carries with you. That's an evaluation and a declaration about your person. You follow that? This is not of the Lord. It's of the old man system. So, if you'll refer to your notes here, in Genesis chapter 2, we pick up this shame story where the Lord... Genesis 2, 16, 17, the Lord commanded them, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, for the, when you do, dying you will die. A few verses later, and it says, the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. So innocence is not ashamed. And I said, I taught this downstairs to the kids, and we had our little girls well, I don't know. Our little girls might come here. I probably shouldn't tell this story, should I? Uh, in other words, they enjoyed being naked. And, uh, uh, and I mean, they were really little. So, But there was no shame. There was no shame. I mean, the neighbors could come over, and they'd be stripped down all to just their little underwear and running around and playing. They're like, they're like two and three. <sighs> they just, those clothes, get them off of me. They were naked, and they were not ashamed. That's called innocence. Now, this is where Adam and Eve were. Then they ate the fruit, they died spiritually, and they acquired a corrupted nature that served self instead of God. They went from being innocent and unashamed to guilty, fearful, and ashamed. When they heard the Lord coming, they hid. The Lord said, where are you? And he said, well, we're hiding. You know, and they built the, they, get, they took these leaves and covered up. He said, why are you hiding? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. And so I hid myself. And you know what the Lord said? Who told you you were naked? How did, I mean, so, nakedness sparked shame. Shame. They were ashamed of being naked. And so they covered up. They, they were now, where they had been joined together, now there were walls. They were alienated. They had to cover up with each other. They couldn't be that intimate anymore. Sin had come in and hindered, even destroyed the intimacy between them. Toxic shame will do the same between you and God. So you, you won't be able to accept the love of God and be open and intimate with God with warts and all, because you have to shut down your soul because of shame. You're ashamed. And I don't mean you're ashamed of something you did sometime. That's normal. You know, I look back on things that I did 30 years ago, and I go, oh, oh, I still have this gut reaction. That's one of those really bad ones. That's normal shame. What I'm talking about is toxic shame, where you, 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 you separate your behavior from your person and you assign worthlessness to your person. I didn't make a mistake. I am a mistake. You know, I didn't act unworthily. I am unworthily. 
I've talked before about my football career. Uh, when I quit in college, I had a lot of opportunity, but I got all mixed up in my life, and I walked away from it. And I did. I told myself, I didn't tell myself, you know, I quit. I quit sports as a young man. I didn't just quit. What was I? I was a quitter. See the difference? It's where you brand yourself. It's where you you determine that you don't measure up with other people compared to what other people have done, and therefore you are less worthy, or you are worthless, or you're less lovable, or you're unlovable, or undesirable, or, 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 or you don't qualify. This is a, the viewpoint about yourself that is, that is just simply part of the old man belief system. All right. And so I, I'm not sure if we'll get to the notes or not. I'm just rambling. But, um, you know, their minds were immediately corrupted with guilt, shame, and fear, mistrust, and alienation. They covered themselves up. They, they hid from God and covered against God and from each other. Oh, you know, we instinctively try to hide our sins because we fear the loss of respect from exposure. I mean, when you come here, listen, as open and as honorable as this congregation is, when you come here, you put on, you put on your best face. I mean, when you walk in the door and they say, how are you doing? You, <laughs> you don't tell the truth, right? I mean, maybe you do, but you don't tell everything. You'd be ashamed for people to know. You know, we've got company coming today. You think we cleaned up? No, we keep it that clean all the time. Don't we, Rhonda? Yeah. Why? Because we'd be ashamed, you know, if things weren't on the up and up. Now, this is, and that's, see, that's normal shame. Toxic shame would be somebody comes over and your house is a wreck and you take that to heart and you think that's just the way I am. You, you, you assign yourself that tag, and that's false, that's wrong. You know, nakedness in the Bible is always associated with defeat or failure or loss. So it, 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 it uh, creates shame. Now, this is for adults. Uh, Job 27, 24, 7, and 10, the destitute spend the night naked and uncovered and have to work while naked. Uh, the Greek word for shame is iskuno. It means to be disgraced. It's a reaction to your flaws and failures and weaknesses being exposed. Shame is a painful feeling of humiliation or distress that's caused by the consciousness of wrong, foolish. You don't measure up. And it is a normal. It is normal, and it's not necessarily wrong. Uh, uh, you know, Study to show yourself approved, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing. So what happens if you wrongly divide? At the judgment seat, you'll be ashamed. In fact, First uh, John tells us, or Second John tells us, that if you, don't, if you don't grow spiritually and live your life in a spiritual manner and develop properly according to the will of God, you're going to stand before the Lord at the judgment seat and you're going to be ashamed. You're going to have a moment of shame, of regret. And, but look, what's not going to happen is you're not going to take that shame. I mean, let's say you get there and you've not done a thing. You threw all of it away. You, want, you threw all your opportunities away and you get there, you know, and everything burns up, but you're still saved, but it's through fire. You're going to be glad to be there? Yeah, absolutely. But... When you see that you've not done anything with all that Christ earned for you and gave to you as a gift, you're going to be ashamed. That's going to last a minute. But what's not going to happen is you're not going to take that in and apply it to your person and carry it on into eternity with you. You're not going to be the loser, the Christian loser in eternity. Even if you think of yourself that way now. 
See, you can't be a loser in Christ. You can't be. But, you know, you say, well, I don't see how this applies. Well, then you don't really know yourself very well. You don't really have a look at yourself. Because this is something that just about every human being does somewhere along the line in their life based on their weaknesses and their failures and some sin they committed or some series of sins or some something. Uh, you know, the ladies listened to this Les, Leslie, Leslie Vernick. Yeah, they, she's a good, she's great. She says, one of the most frequent problems I deal with in counseling and coaching is self-hatred. I've been doing this 30-something years, and it's the same for me. I mean, when people come in and start to talk, it's one of the first things I see, is you don't think very highly of yourself. And I go, well, look, do you beat yourself up? And they're like, all the time. I go, why do you do that? I don't know. I'll tell you why. It's because you don't think well of yourself. You don't think well of yourself. And you think beating yourself up somehow is going to make you a better person. But she says, people tell me I know God loves and forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. I hate myself. Self-hatred is every bit as much a sin as, as hating your neighbor. You hate yourself? <laughs> Listen, does God hate you? But if you hate you, which... Who knows how you should be treated? So quit hating yourself. But it's not that easy. I mean, I'm just saying there's a journey to, of undoing some of these things where you rethink your conclusions that you believed about yourself and you stop looking at all those earthly ones. And I'll get to it in a second. But when you see yourself as who you are in Christ... It resolves every human problem that you've ever had. And every, see, the whole old man, new man study is about taking off the lies that you concluded going through your life. You misunderstood what was happening and what the lesson was, and you believed the wrong thing, often putting yourself down that something was wrong with you in your humanity, sinful humanity. Of course it's true. But listen, if you're in Christ, none of that stuff applies to you. You failed. What do you do? What are you supposed to do? Waller in it? Feel bad about it forever and think, oh, I just must? No. You confess it, you repent of the logic behind it, and you move on with your life. Listen, when I, when I read Rebound and Keep Moving, I was 21 years old. That was about a thousand years ago. But when I heard, because I, I had been saved and I was struggling with sin. I mean, I, 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 for a while I was like, I, you know, this is great. I, how could I ever sin again? Well, you know how long that lasted. You know, ask Rhonda how I could sin again. But, and then I said, well, I don't know what to do with this. And then I read that book and it says, look, People feel guilty and they go up and they repent and they ask for this and you know they go and they kneel and everything. He said, quit it. Confess it. Get up. Push on with your life. Man, I thought that's what grace is. And it, it is. But anyway, this lady says, we're all God's image bearers. And although we might not like aspects of ourselves, we are to value and love ourselves because God made us and God values and loves us. In Christ, she said, but well, let's look at what's underneath self-hatred. When I listen to the cry of a person's heart who hates themselves, I hear wounded pride. This is important, wounded pride. The idea is, the idea is that you, out of your human power and your human morality and your human loyalty, see, this is Peter, should have done better. You shouldn't have committed that sin. You know, you shouldn't have fornicated with that person. You shouldn't have committed adultery. You know, you shouldn't have made those mistakes. You know, and, but because you did, now you're worthless. 
Now you're disqualified from God's love. Do you follow the logic, the sinful, ridiculous logic of that? But that is human nature. That's old man human nature. To compare yourself with other people, their success and their failures, and your success and failures, and say, I'm not near, I mean, I just don't measure up. I just don't measure up. And you're looking at all these human things, these old man value systems, and you don't measure up in those old man value systems, and therefore you think you don't measure up. When in reality, God doesn't give a hoot about that, about any of those value systems. <laughs> I went to, uh, I don't know which reunion it was, 40 in Huntsville, we went to one. Uh, that was really funny. The, uh, my rival, there was a guy that for years we were rivals. We were both very good athletes, and we would vie for different positions. Uh, we talked to him. We had a good time. When it was over getting up to leave, he went over and kissed my wife on the lips. I know, that's competition. Yeah, I didn't know it. I didn't know it at the time, or he wouldn't have got out of that place, but <laughs> we'd still be there trying to figure out who was, see, that's the human old man system. We compare. And whoever comes out on top gets to beat their chest. Whoever comes out on bottom is worthless. That's toxic, toxic shame. That's sinful. That's self-loathing. So these people, they fail. This lady says, I'm so disappointed in myself. I have failed to live up to my own standards. And because they failed to live up with their own standards, have you ever failed to live up to your own ideal of yourself? You look back and say, I wish I hadn't done that. I should not have done that. I'm, 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 I'm lesser because I did that. My life is lesser because I did that. My opportunities are lesser because I did that. Listen, all of that is human logic walking by sight talk. It's worthless. Who cares? Confess it and be, live your spiritual life. When you get to heaven, all of these things of you did well or you didn't do well, this career, that career, how many people did you preach to? How many do you know? Look, none of that stuff, none of those, that information is even getting to heaven. It not only won't matter, it won't even exist. The only thing that the Lord is going to talk to you about in eternity is about this life is what you did or didn't do spiritually. The rest of it is just the stage. So this lady says, these people, beat, they beat themselves up. She said, here are some of the things they say. They tell themselves with inner dialogue. You know, Tuesday with the rich fool. What did he say to himself? Inner dialogue. See, it's how we, it's, listen, inner dialogue is just thinking. We think by talking and we think with images. That's thinking. So anyway, these people that are caught in this shame, this talk, this sinful shame, I should have known better. I can't believe I did that. What's wrong with me? I don't understand how I could have been that blind, foolish, and stupid, and sinful, or whatever. So, now, do you beat yourself up? Do you do that, really? Then you really think that somehow you were the one person in Adam that was supposed to bypass having weaknesses and frailties, that you weren't supposed to fail, right? Where do you get to see the, see the faulty... The silliness of that logic, these are lies you're telling yourself. If you beat yourself up, if you criticize and, and beat on yourself inside because of your failures, then I pray to you and I encourage you, stop doing that now. Now. Again, who knows better how you should be treated? You or God. Does God ever talk to you that way? You idiot. You should have known better than that. 
You think God talks to you like that? You know he doesn't. So quit doing it to yourself. Quit doing it now. If you decide to listen to yourself and you decide to stop that, you'll quit it in a week. And when you do, you will feel like a million weights have been taken off of your life. Because you'll quit being so negative with yourself. Quit doing it. It's not right. It's not good. It's not from God. It's a part of this thing that says, I should have been better. I sh <laughs> what you're saying is, I should have had the most wonderful Adam's sin qualities. That's how you're evaluating yourself. And so you're down on yourself because you weren't a better uh, ascetic morality person when none of that matters to God whatsoever. Throw that away. Now, stop beating yourself. See, it's pride. It's arrogance that says, in my humanity, this is Peter, in my humanity and in my strength, I should have had the ability to be loyal, to be faithful, to go to the death for him. I should have had that ability. Where does he get that idea that he should have had that ability? See, this is not just your normal friendship betrayal. Listen, the whole, spiritual, whole forces of spiritual darkness were upon them. A, a human being, a normal human being, supposed to stand up under that? Are you joking? But look, when Peter didn't stand up, when Peter wasn't uh, up to that task, what did he do? He got down on himself. He began to think, I, I'm, I, I believe he decided he wasn't worthy of the ministry. You know, the Lord said, do you love me, Peter? I love that. Do you, are you committed to me, agape? And he goes, Lord, you know I'm fond of you. <laughs> it's funny. He just didn't feel worthy to put himself back in that place of commitment. He didn't feel worthy. You know why? Because he had concluded he was worthless. That is an evil thing in your life that keeps you from being able to apply the doctrine you have. You believe God loves you? Do you experience that? Or are you worthless and therefore unworthy of that? See, that lie will keep you from being able to have a relationship. You can, you can have propositional understanding, but you can't walk with the Lord. So, there's a lot here. Uh, I taught, this is uh, on Sunday nights at 5 o'clock. I do an online Bible study on Zoom. And I'm doing a study called The Gift of Adversity where I'm explaining that uh, God allows adversity in our life for our growth. He, he, he gives it to us for four reasons. Adversity exposes our old man thinking so we can change it. In relationship, it exposes where we're being unreasonable against selfishness so that we can negotiate. It gives us an opportunity to take the spiritual habits that we already have and strengthen them. And it, gets, it gives us an opportunity. The Lord calls us to the witness stand to apply His Word in the angelic conflict, and we honor Him. That's the four reasons I've seen so far to why He gives us this gift of adversity. But if you're still trapped in your human agenda, the gift of adversity looks like a curse to you. You're upset that you have adversity instead of grateful for it. But stuff that, that all this is being exposed, hopefully, in your life so you can see it. Let me say one more thing and I'll close. I just learned this recently. There's, there's at least three different ways to think about truth. One is as a propositionally propositionally, which means as an idea. I propose to you that the things I've said are true. It's, it's Bible class. You come to Bible class and you hear these things and you take them in. That's a proposition. Then there's procedurally, procedurally, which in most churches you'll never even, you'll be fortunate if you get that instead of emotion. 
But then you come to a doctrinal church and you're going to not only get the truth, the propositional truth, but you're going to get some procedures to help you learn how to use that. But then here's where you want to get to. It's called part, participatory truth. And that's where these propositions and procedures become you. They become your reality. They become your way of life. And you throw off these old man things so that you can take the Word of God and the mind of Christ and make it your life. Your life. You cannot do that if you have concluded in a sinful way that you're not worthy of any of that. That because of your failures and your shortcomings, you know, I've been doing these videos and I got this really good camera that David got for me and, and it's right up close and I, I turn on the video and I look at my face and I go, oh man. I'm thinking that camera needs to be like a block away or something. I'll look a whole lot better. Now I could, <laughs> and look, that's just reality. And so I could parlay that into, well, really, I really should just do radio. Uh, but I'm not going to let that. You know why? Because that's some human characteristic that has nothing to do with the spiritual life. So, trying to summarize about two, <laughs> three or four hours of lessons, but I hope that's helpful to you. I hope you understand. And more than anything, I hope you will look at yourself and ask, do I beat myself up? And if you do, look at the next level down and go, what do I really think about myself? What do I really think about myself? And if you don't like yourself very much, you're going to ask yourself, where did I get that? Where did I decide that was true? That I'm just not, because you know what? Whatever caused that and whatever logic and the conclusion you reached, none of that applies to you in Christ. You are who you are in Christ. You are not that person. You are who you are in Christ. Father, Thank you so much. Pray these, these ideas will, these propositions, these procedures of how to apply these things will settle into our soul and we'll choose to throw away those ideas that are in the way and embrace these ideas of health and strength and spiritual nurturance of love and grace and mercy and, and, and confidence and strength that we have in Christ. Let us see us ourselves as who we are in Christ. Because that's how you see us. That's how we're actually going to be forever. All that other stuff that's still stuck in our soul, it's, it's, not, it's of the past. You're a new creation in Christ. All things have become new. Pray these things for our benefit, for our congregation. Father, I pray that, the, that this community would come, that we would reach out in this community, that our community would come to us and hear what we have to offer, and see our love. Pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.